everybody, it's Zach again, NewTutor.com. Wanted to come in and do a video. Uh, I have a very special guest for you today. Uh, his name is Pete Rambo, and this is an interview I, I lined up after a mutual friend of ours, Travis Huey, kind of gave me some background on him, and uh, it sounded like a very interesting guy. And I've been getting emails from him off and on, uh, you know, on my channel. He'd be sending me stuff uh, either through uh, my channel or through Travis, and and always had a good perspective on things. And so my curiosity was piqued, and so I, uh, uh, I wanted to bring him to you and let you hear his testimony because I think it is something – it's a testimony, I think, that could provide encouragement uh, for some of you out there because I get your emails. I get your comments, and uh, some of them are heartbreaking, hearing what you all have to go through, and um, by seeing this truth that's been revealed to you by our Father and uh, his Holy Spirit. And so uh, it's good for me to bring people on my channel every so often who can give their testimony and – give that encouragement to you to uplift you and encourage the saints. Uh, and, and so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to have uh, Pete Rambo introduce him and let him give you his testimony. So Pete, uh, take it away. Hey, Zach, I appreciate the opportunity. I have, uh, I have to tell you, early on when I was um, making the transition into Torah, uh, I found this little website called newtutora.com, and one of, the, one of the really handy tools that I pulled that I still use and recommend to others to this day um, is your uh, sheet, your, your single sheet that's got um, the three days on it. And uh, that is a great download. I keep a copy of it taped in the back of my Bible. I keep a copy of the genealogies taped back there because those are great. You, you, it's, it's quick and dirty for blowing somebody's mind, and then it's like, all right, let's talk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I appreciate it. You took the time to put it together, and that uh, it's, it's been helpful to me on, on more than one occasion, I, I can tell you that. Um, my background, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were missionaries in South America. I lived in South America until I was about 10 years old. Um, and uh, came back. Um, even early in my life, I had a, had a big interest in what was going on in the world. And uh, I was a conspiracy theorist way back when conspiracy theorists, theorists weren't cool. Um, <laughs> went into the, after college, went into the military. Um, and I knew I was called to the ministry before I went to college. I knew I was supposed to be in ministry. And I, I did a really good Jonah and uh, spent time in Korea with the military and then uh, with the 82nd in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and met my bride in the military, um, a blessing. Um, and then a few years of, of just uh, business and everything afterwards, uh, it, every six or eight months, I'd get an application form for um, one of the seminaries, typically one of the Reformed, like Reformed Theological Seminary, one of those. I come from a Presbyterian background. Um, finally, in 1998, I, uh, the father corralled me about the time that my father went home to be with the Lord and uh, took the traditional route through seminary. Got out of seminary, uh, graduated with a Master's of Divinity in 2002, and uh, thought I was going to go back into the military as a chaplain. And I, I'm really thankful now that that wasn't the route that the father put us on. Um, I, I tried, and uh, he closed that door pretty resoundingly. Um, but what it did was, uh, from there, I, I was the principal for a little classical Christian school, and at the same time began pastoring a small country church. Was in that church for 11 years. During that time frame, basically, I had three years, I was the, uh, the principal for the little Christian school, and then was supporting myself doing some custom metal work and custom motorcycle work. Uh, and then working as a funeral director. Uh, during that time frame, though, we started putting together, kind of prepping, putting together a, a, a sustainable little sustainable farm, self uh, trying self sufficiency. And it was uh, it was then that I got interested in aquaponics. I met Travis, and Travis and I have been buds for probably about four years, something like that. Great guy, love him. Um, probably one of my very best friends. Um, and as I was just continuing to kind of research what in the world is going on, I mean, you know, things are crazy out there. Uh, I was just praying to the Father. I said, God, I, I just want truth. I don't care what it costs me. I want truth. There you and, go. That's how it starts. <laughs> it, it did. It did. Um, and he sort of said, well, instead of looking over here at politics and finance and – Exactly. Why don't we look over here and see what's going on in the church? And um, the first thing that really started uh, started me on this quest was a, an increasing discomfort with Christmas. 
And we had just gotten it, it had gotten to where we were ill with the whole commercialized deal. And uh, so I started doing some research and came to the grave realization that the that it had had pagan roots that preceded Christ by a thousand years or more, fifteen hundred years, going way back. And the next thing that fell was Easter. Same thing. It uh, it's a holiday that runs a thousand years before Christ. And I said, God, I, I we can't do this. But at the same time, I'm going, you know, I'm taking this major piece of our culture, major piece of our family, you know, what? not just my family, but the larger family. I'm the eldest of six children. Um, Kelly's got family, you know, all, all of that. And I, I said, I realized we're taking it out. Now what do we do? I said, God, what do we do? And I can remember sitting at my desk at work and just praying about this. And um, and uh, it's it was just kind of this light. Well, God gave us some festivals or feasts or something, and I had been to a Seder Passover meal maybe eight years before. So I started reading and researching, and the next thing I realized is, hey, this is not the Feast of the Jews. This is not custom. It's not tradition. This is what he wants. And, uh, and that, that was the beginning of our journey about three years ago. And uh, interestingly, Travis and I were talking a lot during this time frame, but we weren't necessarily we were on these par this parallel course, and so we're having this this running discussion. Um, but we ended up celebrating uh, Rosh Hashanah and uh, Sukkot the first year together, and um, got together for that. It was a blast. Had another family that was friends with us um, that had, that since have said, eh, you know, we don't know, and so we pray for them and we love them. God bless. I hope they come back. You know, but. Um, about 18 months into that, uh, and, and during this time frame, I'm pastoring this little church, and my discomfort with the holidays had gotten to where I didn't preach the holidays the way churches traditionally preach them. I didn't take you know four month, uh, four weeks off of my series of sermons. To, I just kept right on preaching because my habit was to preach through a book, verse by verse. Um, and, uh, and that didn't go over real well the first year, and the second year when I basically just ignored Christmas, that kind of was the beginning of the end. And around April, uh, March or April of last year, it's been 18 months ago now, I was in the pulpit, um, announcement time, and one of, the, uh, one of the elders said, we need to have a meeting of the elders after church. And in my spirit, I knew, I knew right there that, and I had been praying for freedom. I had been praying to be released, but I wasn't going to take it into my own hands. And I knew, standing in the pulpit, I said, "It's done. I'm finished." And uh, oh, you said, wait, 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 back up. Back. You said that? I, I no, I knew that in my spirit. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Standing right. in the pulpit, yes, I, right, I, I right. knew. Clarification. All right, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I knew standing there, um, and uh, and and it was peace because I had for months I had been praying. All right, Father, now what do I do? Because this, I'm not in the right place anymore, and I know it. But I was waiting for him to release the ties. I wasn't going to do it prematurely. Um, and after church, uh, one of the elders says, uh, you know, we got together for a meeting, and he says, you know, things aren't going so well, what have you, and we think we need a change. Uh, would you be willing to step down? And I said, I, I knew as soon as you said it that was coming, and I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Since then, the church is closed. They're no longer in business. Oh really? Well, yeah, and, and and it's sad. That's not. Uh, it's just a little country church, and it, out in the middle of nowhere. It was. It was tough. Tough place. It, it was a good place in the wilderness where the father was working in me. That's that's mm -hmm. what it was. Um, it's a shame, you know. You, that's some kind of. Obviously, you tried to share with what you were learning, and yeah. people were not receptive to it. And uh, uh, you know. Uh, there was truth coming out of you. The Father was using you, and and who knows how many seeds you may have planted, you know, for future harvest. Uh, but at the same time, it's a shame, you know, that something like that. And I've I've heard that story over and over again from other people who, who've gone through that and process. It's painful, yes. and uh, it's 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 just a shame, you know, when a door ha a church has to close its doors because uh, they can't recuperate, you know, from the loss of a pastor who's seen the truth. Um. So from there, uh. We started doing Shabbat at the house. Um, the boys were interested in a video series. I had seen World Net Daily pop up a video series multiple times called The Seventh Day by Hal Holbrook. 
Mm-hmm. And we got it. We got it. We we did not have cable, and so television was kind of hey, this is cool, you know. It's something we can watch. Um, and so we <laughs> we watched this series. It's a it's a five hour DVD set, and uh, got to the very end of it and realized it was probably an SDA product, which I don't agree with everything they say, but it but the first four or four and a quarter of that DVD is just a fantastic. Um, set up for the entire Sabbath day thing and, and we were convicted. We were convinced and uh, began practicing Sabbath at home. Um, mid uh, Middle of June last year we were convicted of um, we saw Jim Staley's uh, um, What Not to Eat I think it's called and became convicted of, uh, of What Not to Eat. <laughs> <laughs> And so we sold our hogs at a loss. We at that point on our little homestead, we had some hogs. Uh, we sold them. We sold the rabbits that we had. We gave away all the pork and bacon and shrimp that we had in the uh, in the freezer. It was a the real irony of the whole thing is is I one of my brothers was like, well, I mean, you know, you're just getting rid of it. I said, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can have or some of it. He he purchased. I mean, this was organically grown and fed some of the best bacon that we'd ever made. Um. And then later on, when I when I had a conversation with him about the fact that what I was convicted of, he said, "And you sold it to me." <laughs> <laughs> of course, they're still eating, but he needed something to put a guilt trip on me for. <laughs> um, during this whole time frame, going back into my my problem with Christmas and Easter, I um, had been sending, keeping my denomination apprised of what was going on in my heart and head. And it was at this point, they, they weren't really concerned until this point when I sent them a letter and I said, you know what, I, I have come to the complete realization that, that we have absolutely made some mistakes in Christendom, that um, it, those mistakes are anti-Semitic in, in nature, and we need to be keeping Torah. That didn't go over very well. Oh, I bet not. Um, it, it, and they were they were very loving, very kind, but they no, asked. Wait, 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 wait. Well, hold on. Let me stop you here for a second. So I don't want to interject questions as they come to me. Sure. You are a person who had ordained, who has a master of divinity. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. so, I mean, you have just blown your top at this point in their eyes. They have to see this guy has just gone completely nuts because this is a seminary pro- trained professional pastor who is going nuts. In their mind, I mean, are they are they trying to save you at this point? Are they are they are they uh, are they are they reaching out to other clergy that that could help come in and, and talk you out of what you're doing? What's going on here with that? You know, you know, it was everything was low key up until this point. This is where the story gets kind of interesting, and probably where a lot of a lot of people will be able to relate with what happened over the course of the next probably three months. Um, first off. A couple of different things were going on at the same time. Also, I, I had come to a position with the name, and up to this point, obviously, I haven't used the name because I'm talking about pre-understanding, and you know, of course, we figured out, came to the understanding is the name of the Messiah is Yeshua. <laughs> yeah. Understanding that, wow, even in the translator's notes in the front of my Bible, it says Yahweh, and I mean, come on, seven thousand times you've got to take it out of the manuscript, and so it, it, that kind of stuff, it, it just really started to grate on me. Um, I, I went through the normal steps of anger, hurt, um, being really upset that I felt like I had been misled. I was doubly upset that I felt like I had been misleading people because I hadn't been teaching teaching the fullness of the word. Um, so keeping the, keeping this committee apprised, and the committee chair and another man asked if they could come have lunch with me so we could have a discussion. And um, they wanted to hear more about what I was thinking and feeling. So we went to lunch, and I, it was pretty telling. Um, to start with, I was wearing my seat seats. I had just started wearing seats. <laughs> and, um, and these two guys say, well, what are those? And um, I had to explain. I said, well, look, it's, a, it's right here in Numbers chapter 15. And they're like, what? <laughs> And then, you know, we sat down at the table, and they started asking me a few questions, and it was telling. I was the only one that brought a Bible. And that, to me, was just mind-boggling. I was sitting there just, it was stunning that they were so confident that they had all the answers that they didn't even bother bringing Bibles to have a discussion about theological questions. Right. And I, I sat there, and 
when they would ask questions and I would explain, but if I got so far into it that I started really backing it up with solid scripture, they were like, no, that's, that's good enough. Let's move on to the next thing. They didn't want to know anymore. They really did not want to know. From that point, I was asked to come meet with the full committee. Uh, this is November time frame, and we had started attending Shabbat at a fellowship that I found about 40 minutes from the house. Um, I went to meet with the committee. I sat down, and they said, well, we don't really want to know what it is that you believe. We just want to be sure that you no longer agree with our standards of worship. And, I, I, it, you know, even the terminology, it's, the, it's the, the Reformed tradition. It's the, we, you know, do you adhere to the Westminster Confession of Faith? It's not do you adhere to Scripture, it's do you adhere to the Westminster Confession of Faith? And those kind of things really, the farther along I went on the track, the more I realized that the requirement of being a member of that denomination, and probably most any denomination... Oh, they're all the same way, I guarantee you. They're yeah. all, I, I, I'm from a Baptist background, they're all the exact same. Yeah, the, you have to read the scriptures through their lens... And if you don't read it through their lens, you you know, there's not true fellowship there. And when I realized that I was trying to take denominational lenses out of the way, and I just want to see what does Scripture say. During the same time frame, a pastor, a, a rising star in his denomination, um, according to some who have told me, what... Uh, uh, was teaching a course at the homeschool co-op that my sons were participating in. And his course was research papers, how to write a research paper. And so each of the students, these are, these are junior high and high school students, my two boys, 16 and 13 at the time, were supposed to select their own topics. And so my youngest selected um, dietary laws, and my eldest selected uh, the Sabbath, scripturally speaking. And he was not excited about that at all. And these boys read and researched and read and researched. Um, my eldest turned out, a, and both of those page, papers are now on my blog. I've got a blog where, where I just write about the things I'm learning. Um, but both of those wound up on my blog the eldest paper is 16 pages typed single spaced. The other one was 13 pages typed single spaced with scriptural background. And he, they ended up not doing as well in the class as they should have because, in his words, they didn't use enough information <laughs> from, from the fathers, the church fathers. They relied too much on scripture to inform their opinion. Oh, the horror! I kid you not. <laughs> uh, about this time in the community, and, and he is pastoring the church that most of my family is still in. About this time, I went, I tracked him down, because I was hearing things in the community, but nobody was talking to me. Nobody would come talk to me. So I, I tracked him down, and we sat on his porch for five hours, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, having this discussion. And he told me that I was interpreting the scripture too woodenly. Um, towards the end of the conversation, he said that, that my problem is I was taking scripture too literally and not de depending enough on the church fathers. Um, and I, 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 I told him, I said, respectfully, I think it's just the opposite for you. I think you spend too much time with the church fathers and you don't spend enough time informing your opinion with what Scripture says. You, you worry about them telling you how to interpret the Scriptures instead of looking at it and saying, what does it really say? Mm -hmm. um, and then I received an email right after that that, that uh, told me that he and the elders in the church had come to the conclusion that um, I've, I had ostracized myself and my family, and the most loving thing that they could do is to stop talking to us. <laughs> And so, and really, I mean, people from that uh, from that congregation would not return my calls. I mean, calling about, we're neighbors, we're friends. These are people that I've grown up with. I grew up in that church from the age of 10 on. And they would turn around in the, in the supermarket or Walmart or whatever and walk the other way. Um, it, was a, it was a challenging, that was a very challenging time. Um, and... I, 
I mean, I can remember riding down the road and just a, a song that I that I really love that was playing on the radio, just weeping because saying, you know, Father, open open my mama's eyes, open open the eyes of the elders of that fellowship, just show them some truth. And um, hey, I love my mom, but she will not have a conversation with me about this. Nobody in my family uh, join the club. Yeah, they. Uh, Nobody will come to the house. Nobody wants to sit down with the Bible and have a discussion. If the topic comes up at a family gathering, I, it's like they're, they're all on a switch, and they will turn, and the, the whole conversation changes, and they're not interested. Yeah, you know, it's, I, again, I see this uh, humbleness that I don't see in a lot of other places or people, uh, especially people who have a master's in divinity or, or someone who's been seminary trained, uh, because their entire career is based on what they've, they've been told they know now. And, and, and so uh, they see their entire career being flushed down a toilet if they, can, if they do something that the, the congregation will uh, be at them for. And so um, I just see this whole, you know, over and over again, the willingness of someone to get on their knees physically get on their knees, humble themselves before the Father and say, show me truth no matter what the cost. And, you know, it, and as much as you and I, and I'm sure like many, many others who are watching this, uh, this channel, who, who have just pulled our hair out trying to get our loved ones, those we care about, our friends, to see what we're seeing in the Scriptures and open the Bible and just hear the words of our Father. They're not going to see it until they humble themselves too, like we have, and said, no matter what the cost, Lord, no matter what the cost, Father, I, I will do anything if you show me the truth. Right. And, uh, you know, you got to come to that on your own. You can't force it upon somebody. Right. And, and I realize there's an aspect of the Father having to open eyes and... There, there is something incredible going on in our generation that we are so blessed to be a part of that um, couldn't have been imagined 40 or 50 or 60 years ago by those who came before us. Um, I, 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 don't, I, don't know, I don't know where it's leading. I mean, I have no clue. And I'm not going to pretend to know where the, all this is leading, but you're right. It is absolutely amazing what you're seeing here in our generation and a lot of people can't explain it. And I don't know where it's going or where it's heading to but it's interesting to watch. But continue. Go ahead and tell me uh, some more. Well, it's uh, we started attending this little Messianic Fellowship about 40 miles from the house um, and had been in there and we were just looking for a place to heal, looking for a place for fellowship, a, a place to grow. I, I, I was suddenly just stunned by how little I knew and understood about Scripture as a whole. Um, I, I, I knew the pet doctrines. I knew the, the little the, the, the thin veneer of theology that's on top of it all, but all of a sudden there's this, there's this massive depth of understanding that opens up, and it's just it's a wonderful thing. But uh, we were in that fellowship for three and a half or four months, and I, I had seen, uh, I think it's Ed Harris, if I'm not mistaken, I had seen his video saying, well, you know, if you're going to be in uh, Messianic leadership, you need to have probably been walking tour about three years and some of this kind of stuff. The guy who was leading that fellowship had been there for a while, had uh, had some a family situation, decided to take a sabbatical, and he told us one Shabbat, no warning at all. He says, this is my last one. I'm going to be gone for a while. Don't know when I'll be back, yada, yada. And everybody kind of turned and looked at me. And I'm like, <laughs> you're the pastor. You're the one with the master of divinity. <laughs> you have to be kidding me. I'm the youngest guy. I, you know, I'm the newest guy in the walk of the room. you got to be kidding me. Um, but really, you know, that's it, it's been a blessing. It's been a major... Uh, um, the the uphill climb has really just just recently started to taper off a little bit, but the last last ten months or eleven months has just been drinking from a fire hose, and it's been wonderful. Every bit of it's been wonderful. Absolutely. And, now tell tell me about your family though. How did they transition all this? What was some of the feedback you were getting from your wife, um, uh, your kids? You know, uh, tell me about that, and uh, maybe your extended family too. Um, my my bride Kelly is uh, is. Military. She's 100% disabled as a result of a parachuting accident. She lost both hands in a parachuting accident while we were dating. Um, neat, sweet lady. She's always been supportive. I think I have more than a few times done some crazy things, and she may have initially thought, well, this is just another phase Pete's going through. 
Um, but spiritually, I've always been the head of the house, and so she was willing to explore and follow. Uh, so, so we made the trek together. It, it, there wasn't a lot of... Um, are you still there? Did I lose you? It says live, but your, your camera stopped moving. So we made the trek and the transition together. Um, and the children, the, the, can you hear me? Are you there? Yeah. Hey, Pete. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Uh, we, had, we had some uh, network difficulty problems right there. It kind of cut out. So go back to where you said your, your wife had, uh, had a parachuting accident. What did you say after that? She, uh, she had a parachuting accident, lost both hands um, in a high-voltage power line incident uh, while we were dating. And uh, she's always been super supportive of me. I've always been the spiritual leader of the home. Uh, we've always been really tight in terms of sticking together. Um, so she was willing to explore and make this transition. Um, it, it wasn't without its own bumps. I think probably the most maddening thing of the whole thing is that when people did have questions or if they were willing to ask a question, they would ask her. They wouldn't come ask me. And, uh, and she would... She doesn't have the same scriptural foundation and background, and so she'd say, go ask Pete. They don't go ask Pete. They just don't ask. <laughs> yeah. well, that that kind of made us crazy. Um, the boys handled it fairly well. Uh, as homeschoolers, they were continuing to get good fellowship in the um, homeschool co-op that we've been participating in. But uh, the, the church that we were in that I was pastoring did not have any young people. The congregation that we, that we started, uh, st that, that we joined once we went into the Messianic did, and a lot of them. It's a small congregation, but it's almost 50% teens or younger. Wow. Which, uh, it's fantastic. Um, we average probably somewhere between 40 and 50 on the average Shabbat, and, and we've got easy 20, 22 kids in there. And so that, that helped make the transition a whole lot easier for them from the perspective that others were going through it at the same time or, you know, somewhere along that walk as well. So that helped a lot. The, uh, they, they're very much on board, and my young men, um, they have studied, and they love to be able to learn and articulate and, um, and, and do the apologetics. Very cool. Very cool about your extended family. I mean, mom, dad, if they're still around, um, uh, aunts, uncles, uh, anything like that. What happened there? Yeah, dad died in 1998. Uh, he's, he's really the one that led me down the road early on in terms of a conspiracy theorist, and he was, a, he was very much a deep thinker, kept a list of questions in his Bible that he wanted to ask, things that, things that didn't make sense. And I so wish I could have this conversation with him. Because I think that this would have been, he would have been all over this. He had always loved Israel, loved, loved the people. I think he just didn't understand the fullness of what it means to be grafted in. Um, and like I said, mom, solid lady who loves the Lord, but she just, she does not, it's a conversation she doesn't want to have. And I suspect that maybe part of it is in her mind, the question is, if she goes, is she even denying the relationship that she had with dad? Um, but that's not a question that I'm willing to answer for her. She's going to have to wrestle with that herself and figure it out. Um, right. The rest of my family, uh, a number of them in ministry uh, in one form or another, they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Isn't that just in, amazing? In fact, we, we mailed uh, Michael Rood's... Um, uh, Red Sea Crossing. I, that's a nice, benign, easy, kind of fun video. That It's great. It's a good introductory kind of video that, that whets your appetite a little bit. Uh, at least one of them got mailed back unopened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do you do? What do, you do? <laughs> that's crazy. I don't even want to look at it. Yeah. You just laugh. I, you know, that kind of stuff is just petty. And it's just, you know, half of me laughs and half of me wants to cry, you know? What are you going to do? I know, it's like, I, I just, you know, sometimes you sit there and you wish somebody would just come save me, come save me from this cult that I found myself in. Yeah. And nobody will, will come and change you, try to change your mind or oh, just sit down with you and just open the Bible up and look at some scripture. They don't want to do it. They just, it, it's, I don't know, it's too painful. I, I don't, I don't understand that, how well, that I, works. I, I mean, you're exactly right because these are, 
family members or the elders in the church. I served in that church as an elder while, uh, while in seminary and shortly thereafter. Those are men who swore an oath before God to look out for and, and protect my family and me from a spiritual standpoint. And yet they will not come talk to me. Uh -huh. They won't. Just won't do yep. it. Yeah, it's painful. It's really painful for them that to have to to have to do that. Um, Christmas is coming up, and uh, so what does your family do now? With uh, I mean, and now you're I know you're in another fellowship that has to, doesn't have to worry about that stuff anymore. But I mean, how does your family? Does your family still get together? Do they try to get together? Do they pressure you? Because here's the deal: I get a lot of people who are new. You know, it's new to Torah, right? And so I am one of the first websites that people do find on the internet, on Google, and things like that. And so. Um, I get a lot of questions. You know, how do I deal with this? How, I have my family who is pressuring me to come in and, and spend time with them, or at least go to dinner with them, and uh, you know, uh, pressuring me to accept presents and, and think. You know, what what do you do? What have you found to do? I mean, you you're, you're doing this now for a short amount of time, and so you're, I would assume maybe you're still getting some pressure from outside uh, uh, family influences who are trying to get you to do something or partake in some manner. So, what do you think? We've uh, we, we've kind of um, gone through a transition period, and I'm not sure we yet. We put together and mailed it to everyone uh, our first year. This is probably three years ago, and we told them we do not agree with Christmas. We will not participate in any of the Christmas stuff. Um, and made it a point not to not to participate in any family events during the month of December, simply because just being at some places, a lot of times what happens is they would take that as an opportunity to try to uh, try try to somehow put some Christmas on us. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, I will say that we love our children and uh, and we enjoy doing things for them. And so what we decided to do was do thanks gifting so that we could we could bless our children the way that we love to bless our children. Um, but we were much more reserved in what we did in terms of stuff. Uh -huh. um, and explaining to them this is this is different. And and so they got something Thanksgiving. Uh, last year we did something a little more in conjunction with Hanukkah it was early in the month of December um, and had some fun with it. This year we've we've done a little bit, but we've already had this conversation with the boys because Kelly and I don't feel real good about about that, and so we've already had a conversation with the boys. We've said, you know what, this is the last year we're doing this. We love you, and we're going to do something some other time of the year. But this is just too close, and it's still too connected, and right. we, we want to completely sever that. So it has been a process. I mean, I got a I got a text message from one of my brothers this morning, and he and it said, "Do you celebrate Thanksgiving?" And I uh, said, "Yeah." Um, it's, you know, it's a, he wanted to know if we could join the family, but we already have other. We're going to be going over to Kelly's uh, parents for Thanksgiving Day. Um, but it, it's it, it's this trying to find this balance because I love my extended family and I don't want to cut them off. I want to keep that door open as much as I possibly can, but I also have to have to be firm and say these are some lines we will not cross because we're convicted of them, and so we're going to have to fellowship in some other ways or other times. Um, right. You know, a lot of the emails I get, uh, people, uh, they, they look at the commandments, and they see, you know, honor your mother and your father. And uh, my mother and father are requiring me or requesting that I bring my family, my wife and my kids, to the Christmas dinner, and so what do I do? And so uh, I get emails like this, and uh, I agree with you. I think, you know, I cut it off cold turkey. It's like, I'm done doing this. I'm, my family's not going to do it, and we're not going to partake in it. If you try to include us, we're, we're going to ignore it. And, and I'm sorry that's painful. Uh, but, you know, again, make sure your parents, what, this is what we did, we made sure our parents understood that we do love them. We love them tremendously, and that we will get together with them, and we will uh, uh, go out to eat with them and, and do dinners and have, uh, you know, they can come over to our place, they can go over to their place, we can visit. Uh, we now live a state away, but, you know, it's like we, we can um, still get together and hang out, um, but it cannot be during those times. We will right. not get together during those times, uh, but we Maybe. love you and that we still want to honor you. We still want to uh, 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 not, you know, distance ourselves from you, 
but we will not celebrate those things. We will in our house we will serve the you know Yehovah or Yahweh. And so uh, uh, I, that's I think it's a very good answer you gave, and you know that's more part of my answer uh, that I see um, that I try to send out to people when I get those emails, and I get them quite a bit, especially this time of the year. Yeah, and and I think people that tend to slip and fall back into their old ways, maintaining that little bit of a teaser connection is is problematic. I think you have to draw a real hard line. Now, I, I can't say that 10 years down the road that, that I won't be much more sure and confirmed as a family where we are to be able to visit during that time frame as long as we keep all the keep keep everything else out of it but I know this where we are right now in coming in until we've really got a firm foundation and it is established custom in our home um, that that we don't do anything connected with that then it, uh, it, it it is necessary to keep that door completely closed Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with the hard line, and I think we should do that. So, uh, um, so on to other things. Um, uh, you're showing me your uh, your beret there, uh, airborne school. Um, go pull it out and show everybody. <laughs> wow. This is this is going way back. Yeah. This is this is uh, this is way back. You you told me to go get some knives, and in that drawer, I also had this hidden. So that's uh. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And so, hey, listen. Uh, yeah, you went to airborne school, went to ranger school, and um, also you have made some knives. You're a knife maker. Uh, Travis was telling me, and so uh, show some of our. Uh, I know some guys who uh, who watch my channel or into that sort of thing. Go ahead and uh, show what you got here. Yeah, it's, um, I, I enjoy metal work and I enjoy crafting stuff with my hands. And let's see if I can find where the. This is one of the first ones I made, and ultimately the handle on it's a little bit bulky, um, but some fret work on, uh, or, or file work on the back of it look, looks like bamboo, um, and just a little Tidex sheet. Um, something that was that turned out a whole lot better a little farther down the road with some uh, with some practices, a nice Skinner, um, this uh, nice snap-in Kydex sheath with a gut hook on it, um, some. Uh, some, um, I guess, uh, arrowhead work down the back, that kind of thing. It's pretty neat. Um, and it just it snaps in nice. I, uh, I I always got into a great deal of trouble with this thing. I, I made two at the time that I made this one, and uh, I was dressed in a, in a suit and tie. I had my jacket off, and I had this tucked in my back pocket with that much right there hanging out of the back of my back pocket when I went into uh, Subway. To get lunch one day, I was delivering it to a customer. He he, uh, he told me he said a hundred bucks. I, I yeah, I, I'll sell it. <laughs> so he sold it. <laughs> well, no, it's, I, I'm walking out of Subway and there were four town police officers sitting in the booth and and one of the one of them was a lady and she calls me over. She said, "Come here, come here, come here. What's that in your back pocket?" I said, "Well, it's a knife. I made it. I pull it out and I oh, you could hurt somebody with that. You're going to jail." I said, "Uh." -uh. <laughs> oh man, I, I bowed up. I said, "You don't understand. I have a constitutional right." Oh, that didn't go over real well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was interesting. Interesting. Well, all right. Listen, I, I really appreciate you coming on here and uh, and uh, giving our viewers, um, you know, your testimony, your story. And so, you know, like I said, these stories provide encouragement. And we're going to be doing a number of these coming up soon. Uh, I got a number of interviews lined up that we're going to be doing in the next few days. And uh, yours was the the kickoff. So uh, I really appreciate, appreciate you coming this. on my channel and. Uh, it's been good to finally get a hold of you and uh, see you face to face and meet you and hear your story, hear your testimony, and use it to provide an. Did I lose you? Uh oh. It may get back to them. So what would you say to them? I, hold on, I, I lost you, I don't know, probably about 60 seconds ago. You said it's good to hear your testimony, what have you. I'm losing connectivity. Are you, are you connected? I think, I think it's... Uh, yeah, can you, I, I can you hear you now. Plug for a minute? I can hear you now. All right. All right. Are you can hear me? I, yeah, I can hear you. You're back. Okay. All right. Uh, so, all, right. all right, so go ahead and start. Do you hear what I had to say? My no, I missed, I, I missed the last probably, I don't know, 30 seconds. Okay, so uh, basically, you know, what would you have to say to those who, um, 
you know, who you tried to explain this, to, you tried to share with them, you know, what you were going through, what you were seeing. If you had to sit down with them and just, you know, reason with them one last time, what would you tell them? What do the scriptures say? What does the what do the scriptures say? I don't care what what Martin Luther says. I don't care what John Calvin says. I don't care what Augustine or even Jerome, if you want to go back that far. I want to. My my question is, how did they practice the faith in the first century? What was going on in 40 A.D.? What was going on in 50 A.D.? How did they practice the faith? Because that's what we need to be striving for. They didn't have it wrong. They didn't miss the Messiah's words. There was no new revelation after that. What was their practice? And I'd say, read the book of Acts. What did Paul do? Don't tell me what he said, because you misunderstand what he said, because you don't know what he did. I want to know, what did Paul do? And um, when we start looking at what Paul did, and, and I write about this all the time on my blog. Um, my blog really is kind of geared towards being outreach or for putting together pieces that aren't too radical for trying to shake people up and open some eyes. Um, Notsob.com, N-A-T-S-A-B, dot um, com. And, yeah, it just... All right, and we'll, we'll link it at the bottom of the video, too, for sure, so people can find it. I appreciate that, yeah. So, all right, very good, folks. Hey, you heard it here. Uh, Pete Ramble, I appreciate you being on the channel, and uh, we'll have you back again sometime, I'm sure, and uh, and see where you're at, you know, sometime down the road and uh, how, how you're dealing with and, and how everything's progressing with you and your family. So I really appreciate you coming on the channel, and uh, we will do it again sometime. And I hope uh, to you out there, this has been an encouragement for you, and share the mm -hmm. video with somebody else who maybe you know is going through a hard time or has been dealing with the, this uh, this whole truth that's been revealed to them um, uh, I, I think these videos are, are very helpful to people. So, Pete, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Shalom. everybody. That's it. We'll leave it at that. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom Shabbat. So, yeah. all right, we'll leave it at that. Go home, read your Bible. Thanks. Thank you.